have a guest tonight. We're thrilled to be joined by Ian Lake this evening. Welcome and thanks for joining our crew. Hey, thanks for having me, guys. Better Lake than never. (laughs) (laughs) That's that's. I've heard that a million times. Come on. Oh, Brittany, you just got called out. I didn't plan that one. I just thought of it now. Mm. Late late puns I've heard my whole life because I'm not good at being on time. Guess I'm beating the dead Orion. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> oh. Shut up, Wesley. <laughs> I'm done. Oh man. Um no, Ian, you're played, not. <laughs> Ian played the Orion Tolor in episode six of the current season of Star Trek Discovery before his ultimate and untimely demise in episode eight at the hands of his auntie Osira. Uh Ian, let's get right into it. Uh before sure. you got the role of Tolor, were you a fan of uh, Star Trek, the franchise at all? Yeah, sure. I mean, I was never like a devoted faithful, but I've always been a lover of of sci-fi stuff. And I used to watch, I used to watch the, uh, the original series with my dad and stuff on the reruns. And 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 I remember actually when I was a kid, my dad and I built a model of the original Enterprise. I loved, I loved that kind of shit. So, but I never got faithful. But my brother, my older brother, is a mass. He's a Trekkie, and he, like he's born in '78. So like TNG, he was a teenager for that whole stretch so he's the kind of guy that can name any episode of of tng that goes on he's never as big into the other franchises but so i appreciate i've always appreciated star trek and when of course i got the job like my i was like vicariously really excited because my brother was like my brother was like holy shit my brother's gonna be in an episode of star trek you know so was he green so, with envy though he absolutely was but no more green with pride oh yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Now we're, we're sure it's not every day you get a casting call for Star Trek, let alone a an Orion bad guy. Uh, was this a role you came across or and decided to audition for, or and what was the process like? I mean, well, the way it goes is my agent finds me auditions, and and uh, you know they 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 send out we're casting these roles, and and he goes, oh, I think Ian will be right for this one, and he puts me out for it, and it is actually not that uncommon for me to get a star trek audition i've actually auditioned for the show a lot <laughs> and and been and been close to getting cast many times um and uh you get put on hold or a short list or something like that and you're like maybe this one um and then add to that i didn't know it was going to be an orion i didn't know i was going to be an orion until um i got there and did my first prosthetics test so it's like a f- it's all kind of kind of hidden and cloaked when you do the audition even though i knew i was auditioning for star trek i also knew that whatever was happening in the scene was not actually going to be in the script the character was named tolor in the audition but that's about it so i um the thing i was pleasantly surprised about was when i first got the script to see how much great stuff he got to do because i i said i agreed to the job without really knowing what the role was uh, you just say yes because it's Star Trek, and and chances are it's going to be fun. Um, and so yeah, I, when I first read this, all those great scenes with Giorgio, I was like, oh wow! <laughs> I feel like I got the best job. Awesome. I do. I mean, out of all the roles I've auditioned for on Star Trek, this one was clearly uh, by far the meatiest and the most and the most fun. You know, like, uh, do you mind if we ask who else you auditioned for before? Um, yeah. So. I don't know if I'm allowed to say this stuff, but sure. So I was actually close to in season two. There was a there was an episode when when they found like a frozen the guy who initially was on the Shenzhou, and then they found him in space, and then he turned out to be like oh, control, yeah. like mm-hmm. embodied embodied. I got I was on uh, like a shortlist for that part, but yeah. then of course they made the choice to have that character be somebody. That, the, that they had already introduced on the show, which actually I thought was a really smart choice. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's actually my my buddy uh, who who played that part. So, um, and um, Ali Moman is his name. Um, um, what else? I can't remember what else. I, I, I honestly think in the beginning, I might've been close to being some kind of bridge officer, but I but it was also secret that I, I, I couldn't tell what it would have might've been. So I remember like things I didn't get close to, like I auditioned for, 
Jet Reno, like, be- oh, nice. be- <laughs> like Amazing. randomly, like, uh, like a lot of people, like every in their initial like burst of it, and I didn't know what it was until I was watching season two and and saw Tig Notaro, and I was like, okay, yeah, if they're hiring. <laughs> if they're hiring Tig, then I don't think they're gonna hire me. You Speaking know, of okay. awesome personalities, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's amazing. Yeah. Um, so the Orion makeup that you kind of talked about with your prosthetics, um, for mm-hmm. Discovery, it's really unique because, um, they don't just airbrush you green like a lot of people would think they would do for Orions. No. Um, no. we saw a behind the scenes video where they were doing like a full face and neck mold for you. So we're wondering yeah. what's that experience like and how long did you have to sit in the chair getting that done? Obviously not as long as Doug Jones. <laughs> uh, no, although they have Doug Jones's routine down pretty, pretty quick. I think Doug and I were probably in the chair for about three hours each. Noah, <clears throat> who plays Rin, he's in the chair for like five hours. That whole look is a lot oh, more involved. Um, but no, it was about three hours for me and with the wig is, you know, and some days like, some days the, it's a new piece every time, right? It gets thrown out at the end of every day. So some days it'll just like fit right right away. And then some days they'll put it on and be like, no, we have to like take this this flap off and do it again and it takes a little more time but in general it was like three hours um i i didn't mind it i i honestly like the creative aspect of it was really fun and exciting for me and obviously it was something that was uh, only for a finite amount of time so it wasn't like i had that exhaustion that comes from you know week after week after week that like the who the who played arium had to go through or that doug has to go through or like i think that's where it really gets hard is like when it's over a long time so and i got along so well with the guys that work in the prosthetics truck like they're all such incredible artists and and really great people and so we just would chat like you show up at 4 30 in the morning spend the first three hours of your day just shooting the shit getting green silicone plastered to your face um that's the dream yeah, yeah. but i also really like that they did silicone because i'm and i might be on the minority on this i feel like the jury's out on like do we like the the the, the, the season three orion look i personally think it's great that they're using prosthetics to sort of heighten the features and make mm-hmm. them more than more than humanoid you know, and and that for me, it gave me like the sort of bully meat sack aspect of him was way easier to play because that meaty fucking face that I have. Yeah. And I didn't want them to just paint my skin green. I don't think the green skin paint looks um, I it, it 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 looks kind of like basic to me. It looks like ba- it looks like bare minimum to me, you know, and, like and what I, I don't think last week. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Basic ass joke. <laughs> but it's like when I walked into the makeup trailer, this was a Emmy winning prosthetics team that was laying their hands on me. And I don't think they were about to just paint my skin green. They were like, yeah. no, let's make something. And I and I love how it turned. I thought the whole look was really great. I was I did I mean, not look oh go ahead. Yeah, they look like a denser kind of more, you know, they're humanoid, but the the prosthetics they add, add a kind of a denser, more muscular look to them. Right. Yeah, almost like they have thicker skin, you I was know, about like to make that joke. And, and not like, and not in like a good way, but more like, like yeah, they're less penetrable. I don't know if that's a word. <laughs> no, yeah. I think I think Can it be phased. <laughs> um, I, I was gonna say, you know, you said that they're an Emmy-winning, you know, makeup and artist team, and you know, it, I feel like these makeups have come such a ridiculously long way. Um, oh, because you know, incredible. with that prosthetic, you know, you're not being painted. That is a full prosthetic. And it still looked like you were able to emote just as much as you would be if you just had your face painted. I thought that was pretty amazing. Yeah, I had a, I, I had a really uh, enjoyable time working with it as a mask. Like I actually felt like it didn't limit me. It actually kind of like gave me something to play with. And like it had such character in the jawline and the cheekbones that I also like even just even just tilts and, and things I found really communicated. And, and like it was... I felt like I, I didn't feel limited at all. I, I, you know, like you look at Doug, his whole face is, his whole mouth is covered. Are you lacking any emotion from Doug? No, he understands how to, how, what gets communicated from the tilt of a head and the the way he uses his eye movement and everything. And it's really, it's really a cool art form. I feel like you can cover Doug with a brick wall and he'll still win an Oscar. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like that man, you'll see one eyelash and you're just like, it will be the most adorable and sad and creepy brick wall you've ever met, you know? Yep, and I'd give my life for it. 
I'd be a lion if I said I wouldn't. Although Doug was saying, why couldn't we just, why couldn't we just see your, your face? He was like, why did they have to cover you in silicone? I wish they could have all seen your face. I'm like, oh, that's very sweet, Doug. Doug Jones is so sweet. Mm -hmm. He is the sweetest. Uh, so Tolar, he was a pretty nasty piece of work. And as a villain, we thought we might get to see a little bit more of him, unfortunately. <laughs> we don't. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So what was it like getting to play around as a bad guy in Star Trek? And I think most importantly, what was your experience like working with Jonathan Frakes? Oh, yeah. Uh, well, I'll I'll answer the first part first. Um, yeah, it was, it was so much fun getting... To, it, I've, I play a lot of bad guys, but there was something about Tolor that was different from what I've done, which is that he was a bad guy who was not that good at being a bad guy, <laughs> you know, and yes. all of all of his authority was not earned or 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 like carried from any sort of like ability. It was just given by the threat of who his aunt was, you know, and and I, and then he was also really stupid, like he's really stupid. And every time he sort of has any any battle of wits, he's on the losing end. And there's fun and comedy in that. And they had actually, they wrote more of that in the script than made it into the episode. I think in order to keep the stakes high, they they cut some of the like the bits that were him being stupid in order to keep him still adversarial and still like a potential threat to to Giorgio and Burnham, which I think story wise is the is the smart play. Um, but it was. You know, when we were creating it, like I had all these fun bits where I I'm on the losing end of a battle of wits with Giorgio, and and some of it, a lot of it did make it in, and so that was new, and that was like I just felt really lucky, and we were out on location for the first two days, where that big um, it was a, a a steel mill that we were that we were shooting in where they had the Han house set. It was an unbelievable place to shoot, and it was just me and Sonequa and Michelle just the three of us just shooting the shit for my first two days on set, just like, just us. And like, how lucky, <laughs> how lucky right. can I possibly be? Um, and then, um, yeah, working with Frakes was really cool. That was actually, you know, I mentioned how my brother is a big fan of the show. Like when I sent him a selfie of me in my green makeup, with me and Frakes, my brother just kind—he kind of lost it. Um, but also, Frakes is just like—he is Star Trek, you know. Like he comes on set and he's like, "Hello, <laughs> you welcome to my house," you know. Like <laughs> and, I'm and, number one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. We were shooting some stuff on the book on Book's ship for 306 that Aaron Yakoski directed. I told this story on Marcy's Marcy's podcast, but whatever, I'll tell it again. Um, I uh, and Frakes came came by and I had just learned like just learned that I was going to die in the next episode. Oh, man, because I didn't know what was happening with Talor. You know, my suspicion based on how that episode went was that maybe an early draft of the script had him dying in that fight with Burnham and Giorgio. It looked and like it was going to go that way. Oh you know? yeah, like the fact that I'm just like beep, 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 bye, you know, like, um, <laughs> like that's just such a great, a nice out. Um, and uh, and so I could tell that the right, I could tell by that that the writers were still figuring out what they were gonna do with Tolor, and um, and actually I was being held for multiple episodes so that they had room to decide, and I was really hopeful that like it would continue because I was having the most fun I've ever had in my life. And, uh, and I, it's a funny story. This is the long version of it, but I was sitting talking, just me and Sonequa were like sitting, waiting to go shoot, shoot a scene. And, and she's like, so what's going on with your character? I said, I don't know. I'm, I'm on hold for 306 and 308 and, and I'll see what happens. And she's like, well, I just got the script for 308 and you're the first line of the script. And, uh, I was like, "Oh my God, give me that!" And so initially, that scene with initially the scene with Tolor and and Osira was the opening sequence of the episode when they like in early drafts of the script, um, before they introduced the the ship's mission first and then went and cut to them. Which again, when I watch it, I'm like, "Yep, that makes perfect sense." Uh, you know, raise the stakes and then throw it to them. And like, uh, I read this 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 
scene. I'm like, oh my God, this is great. And Osira, and like there was, it was a longer scene and there was a more comedy in it. I'm like, oh, awesome, awesome. And then he gets teleported into the cage and it gets like, what happens in the cage? Oh, he gets devoured. Okay, he's dead. All right, okay, he dies. And and like, you know, then you go to shoot your next scene knowing that you're about to get killed off in a few days. And Frakes was there on set. <laughs> and I had never met him and he's like just hanging out even though it's not his episode to direct and he's saying hi to everybody. He's like, hey, nice to meet you. We're gonna kill you in a couple <laughs> of weeks, you know? I'm like, yeah, I just found out, thanks. <laughs> nice to meet you too. But hey, working with him was, Sorry, working with him on the actual scene was great. The fact that my death scene and my and and that scene with uh with Osira, that was my my time working with Frakes. That was special. And like we had so much fun shooting the death. We shot way more than they showed. <laughs> we shot stuff where they went, they went like straight down my mouth while I'm sc screaming and oh, oh I like felt the matrix sort I of like ah. Yeah, like initially when I got teleported in there, I like fell over on the ground and was like, took way longer to orient myself. Like it was really just Tolor being a mess. Um, and that was- So more and, the better. Yeah, and, and him just yelling at me from off camera being like, I now scream and like, yeah. Sort of <laughs> oh man, I could just imagine him saying like, saying something like that really loud in such a freak's way. That's hilarious. Yeah. Um, I, I have to go off subject here real quick because we have our Twitch viewers and uh, they are all curious and saying hello to your dog. Who is your oh, awesome yeah. pup and what is his or her name? This is Stevie. She's a she and uh, she's my um, she's my rescue and she's Aww. trying to sleep, but she's got she's missing a leg and she's pretty damn awesome. And she says hi, everybody. Aww. Hi, Stevie. Hi. Stevie. Aww. I actually wanted to bring her to set with me when I was working on the show, but I was worried that she wouldn't be know what to do with the fact that like I have my voice, but I don't look golf. <laughs> yeah. like I think it would have freaked, freaked her out. Yeah. yeah. If I, if I put a hoodie on, my dogs don't even recognize me. <laughs> <laughs> um, Eric, I know that you had a uh, another question that didn't we didn't have on uh, our outline. Yeah, I'll do it now. Um, so, okay. Star Trek so. is known for having amazing uh, Shakespearean actors on their show and mm -hmm. if anyone has seen your 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 stratford performance as macbeth uh from the 2016 production which is one of my favorite and i got to see it live and it was amazing And it's one of my posters that i have in my room here that i didn't want to just show you uh because that would have been awkward <laughs> but um oh, but now he's yeah. making it awkward. <laughs> but now i'm making it awkward so. no it's not awkward i so, love it so uh renee abergenois who played odo on ds9 said actors with a background in the larger than life works of shakespeare or even musical comedy adapt easily to non-real characters and bring a sense of truth to them what do you think of that like bringing shakespeare to star trek honestly it felt like home like i Especially because, like, when I was doing Shakespeare at Stratford, which for those viewers who don't know, Eric lives near a town called Stratford, which is a, a one of the biggest theaters in North America where they do a lot of classical theater and they put on this big festival every year. It's exceptional, exceptional theater. They do it at the highest level. And I had the great privilege of working there for about seven years. Wow. And, um, and uh, a lot of it is creating a world you know, because so so often you put on this play and you can set it anywhere. And even if you set it in modern day, you're still creating a world because of the way people speak and the way people carry themselves. And and you're often like you're in the basement with uh, in a fitting room and there's a designer and a cutter and they're building a costume for you. And you're part of this whole process where they're pinning things to you and talking about, oh, and, and then you have to have a voice about, well, my character moves like this and I have to be able to move that way. And that doesn't really usually happen in TV. Usually in TV, they, they you go put on some jeans and a hoodie and you say some cop speak or some like, I didn't do it, I'm the bad guy speak. And there's not that same process. And on Trek, it exists. And it's so exciting because I got to show up like a week before I shot anything and collaborate. Like Gersha Phillips, who's a costume designer, holy shit. Does that woman have taste and an eye and a, and just like her work on this show in particular is stunning. So they built me this thing and I got to be a part of that with the cutter and the designer saying, well, what if we tucked this here and Ian, what's your movement gonna be like? And it just felt familiar to me. It felt like that. And then also wearing a weird costume that's not normal clothes and saying language that is heightened and, 
and not the way we normally speak, but still making it seem natural, making it seem like a person thinking and, and going about their life. Like that's what the task is when you put on a Shakespeare play. So yeah, I felt really comfortable, strangely, in this wide, wide world. And, I, and it made sense to me why so many great Shakespearean actors have been in the Star Trek. I mean, some of the biggest ones have been, you know, their biggest success was on Trek. Yeah. And like, and William Shatner started his career at Stratford mm -hmm. too. So there you go. <laughs> um, you know, not, to, not to mention, when I first did my prosthetics test, um, they, they said, oh, <laughs> you can actually enunciate. Because a lot of people, you're wearing lips on your lips. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people end up fed, 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 fed. and uh, like, you know, getting trained to speak and articulate Shakespeare like that comes in handy when all of a sudden you're wearing extra lips on your face, you know, so. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I think this is actually a great segue into our next question here uh, about, you know, kind of like getting into character and uh, making them your own. Uh, there's been some talk on Twitter um, that Toller maybe seemed a bit more uh, menacing than Auntie Osira. Um, if, if you could imagine your character still being around and, you know, not eaten by a transform, do you think he maybe could have overthrown Osira? Do you think he maybe wanted that place at the head of the table? You know what I would love? It would have been like if if she like failed in killing him and then he kind of like went and teamed up with with like the Federation and like took her down, you know, but like still was like pissed off and not like, not nice. Still was like, I'm, I'm still mean, but I, I will help you, you know, yeah. like, <laughs> and like, I will be benevolent, but I'm still a bad dude. Don't like a Shakespeare play with a Shakespeare yeah. answer. Yeah. I think it's funny that he was more menacing because I just think he's more of a blowhard, you know, like he just tries harder. Whereas she doesn't need to because she's like, I have this weird ring that will just kill anybody, you right. know, like whatever that ring does. Is you you were mentioning though that, you know, Toller's a little bit dumb, right? He he's kind of yeah. got that, like that blind, bad, like yeah. dumb bad guy luck. And that can sometimes get bad guys in TV and film into higher positions of power than they maybe are supposed to. Yeah, yeah. Just a bit of nepotism and a bit of idiocy and you've got a perfect cocktail. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> a little pinch of both. Yeah, exactly. Um, finally, Ian, uh, where where can people find you uh, as we wrap up our interview here? Uh, any up, uh, upcoming projects that you'd like to share with us? Um, uh, my Instagram is Ian H Lake. If you want to find, if that's what find you means, I, that's my Twitter is Ian Lake. Um, I have a actually, you know what? I just I just uh, I just got a new job uh, a couple of days ago that I'm excited about, but not at liberty to talk about yet. Mm -hmm. um, Always the case. Um, but, uh, but I will, you know, make sure I keep fans posted uh, when there is talkable things to say about, I'm sure, I'm sure at some point it, it'll be something I can say I'm a part of, but I'm, uh, I'm, I don't want to step in it before I've actually signed my contract just yet. You know, <laughs> yeah, we will be. go ahead. Eric. I have two little things. Um, okay. One, why did you change Sir Ian of the Lake from your Twitter, which was amazing. <laughs> Uh, back in the day, and I promised uh, Aaron, our co our co-host, who isn't here today, um, to show you something because um, one of my you asked me what one of my favorite things in the that I in this crazy room that I have is, and my favorite thing in my house is a picture that I printed, and it's upstairs uh, on my top floor, and it's a memory I had doing. Um, you'll see once right here, and there was an yeah. event in Toronto where we got where they tried to get a uh. hundred guitars. And it was you were there. And it ended up being nine hundred guitars. You were there, and I was there, and I I took an amazing That's photo because I was one of the day. first people. So I was near the front, but at the end of the show, because my family was really young, my wife was there and my baby was there, and it was the only baby that was allowed in the theater. They were like, as long as the baby doesn't cry, she can stay. And there's this picture of us. <gasps> um. No I'm, way! We're meeting, and um, yeah, so that's probably one of our best memories. And she used to dance to your music all the time. Wait, is that uh, Ian? That in was the picture? Ian. Yeah, that's me. Oh, that's I had hair. I had hair. Yeah. Yeah. So that's amazing. I mean, and I will say that day is a special day for me, man. Like that experience from my end too was pretty breathtaking and special and rare. And like I and I actually. 
funny side note, they asked me to do this thing where I lead a hundred people in guitar singing one song. And my first reaction was that's going to be a fucking nightmare trying to get a hundred people to play a song. Yep. And then they were like, there's more and there's more. And I was really pessimistic and was like, this is going to be a nightmare. I don't even want to do this. It's going to be such a shit show. And 950, 40 some odd people showed up and sang in perfect unison and played in perfection. And it was like, it was like standing on stage being like rocked by like the most incredible thing. And then I was like, Ugh, I gotta do this thing. For, you know? Amazing, Eric. That's really cool. That's an amazing story, man. Thank you for sharing. What a full circle moment. So when you saw who it was, what the fuck was your reaction when you were like, who's this Tolor guy? Well, I, I recognized your voice, but I didn't recognize really? you. Like I, because oh. I'd seen you on like Working Moms and other TV shows, and I'm like, sure. oh, Ian Lake sure. again. And then I saw your name in there. I was like, oh, who's Toller again? Oh yeah, damn. And yeah, I did not recognize you at all. <laughs> that was very crazy. cool. Very yeah, cool. Yeah, the, the the two looks are completely different. I yeah. mean, I would never know that you were Tolar. So yeah. <laughs> yep. Yep. Um, Ian, that about does it. We want to thank you so much for coming on our show and taking some time to speak with us. We had an absolute blast. Super fun, you guys. Thanks for having me on. I, I enjoyed it. You're very welcome. And we'll be waiting anxiously for your uh, your next project. So um... I, I, I am too. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for beaming into our podcast today. If you want to keep the hailing frequencies open, you can subscribe on Apple and Google Podcasts, YouTube, and Spotify. Like what you hear? Put in a good word with Starfleet and leave us a five-star review.